Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is C.M. Alexander with the news. On behalf of our entire team, we'd like to wish Josh and his wife a happy anniversary. We pitched in and sent them a present that should be arriving any moment. So if you're listening, we hope you enjoy the additional responsibility we forced upon you. Oh, and don't forget, it poops more than you think. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here with a quick announcement before we get to the episode. You might be wondering why this is LT's theory of pets and not cell. Josh and his wife recently had a baby, and so we are releasing this episode that Josh and I recorded in preparation for that a few months ago with our good friend and first dollar baby director interview, Ian Klink. Cell will come out on August 8th. Thank you to Ian for being our guest and to our patron, Phil Thiessen, for graciously allowing us to push back his pick to our next release date. On to the episode. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King book club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, CM Alexander, alongside Joshua Kahn. Hey, everybody. And today we are joined by return guest, our very first Dollar Baby interview, director Ian Klink. Oh my gosh, thank you guys so much for bringing me back. Great to have you back. Today we are going to be covering the short story, LT's Theory of Pets in Everything's Eventual, and we have Josh leading our discussion. Okay, first question. (laughs) (laughs) This, This story... I man, I don't know. I don't know about it. But the the preface that Stephen King writes before the story begins proper is about that the worst gift you can give someone is a pet. So my first question, have either of you been given a pet as a gift? I I I mean from like a significant other? No. And but I I mean I have been given gifts from like my parents, but but never Never a gift from a boyfriend, girlfriend. I completely agree with Stephen King. That would be the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> like, yeah, because he's right. You know, he says in the article, like, all right, well, you don't know, one, are they going to like this animal? And then two, hey, here's a gift. Oh, by the way, enjoy cleaning up its shit. Enjoy feeding it. Enjoy spending money on it, you know? <laughs> Yeah, here's this. And Merry Christmas. Here's responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> but I love you. <laughs> CM? I actually have a story about this. Uh oh. And if my mom ever listens to this episode, Mom, I'm sorry. I am calling you out. <laughs> and we've had this discussion since these incidents. My mom was years ago notorious for gifting our relatives. Not her children, like my aunts and uncles and grandparents. She's notorious for gifting them pets. But she does it the way like a gang member would drive by and shoot at your house. (laughs) Except she's giving you an animal. So like, hey, you didn't expect this. You didn't ask for it. You probably don't want it. And now it's yours until it dies in 13 years and you're sad (laughs) and relieved because you didn't ask for it. um, Now I'm just imagining your mom rolling up turning off her headlights, coasting to a stop, running up, kicking in the front door and throwing a dog in and running Uh, back out. It's about right. It was fun for me, though, because I got to go to the pet store and get all these puppies and then we got you a puppy. (laughs) That is that is Uh, nice. So Stephen King is right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you guys. Yes. Uh, For Christmas a few years ago, my mother-in-law got my wife and I a cat and uh, my wife did ask for it. So that was one thing, but I didn't realize it at the time, and I got very <laughs> upset. <laughs> okay, well, let me ask you this. Dog or cat person? Dog. I don't know how to answer that because my husband's allergic to dogs, and we have hypoallergenic cats. I do appreciate the self-sufficiency of cats over dogs. I'm just a piece of shit. I'm not going to wake up at like 5 in the morning to let a dog out. <laughs> I'm going to stand by this, and I, and I don't care if your listeners get mad at me. You can send me whatever emails that you need to send me or hate. Like, cats are dicks. They are <laughs> yeah, just for flat sure. out dicks. They will always be dicks. They are the king of the dick kingdom. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I find it so perfect that Stephen King has done so many stories about cats, 
and they're all evil stories. You know, there's Cat from Hell. There's this LT theory of pet, Church from Pet Cemetery. You know, like they're all these <laughs> evil, evil creatures. And I appreciate that he only did one bad dog. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a really bad dog. <laughs> it, but not that dog's fault. It That's... got bitten by a bat. So it, Cujo was nice. It was the rabies. Right. <laughs> All right, let's get into the story proper. Oh, yes. LT <laughs> is telling the story, and our narrator says that he tells the story very often about how his wife walked out on him. Not how she's likely dead or missing, <laughs> but definitely how she left him. Okay, that first sentence right there, I was like, yes. I don't care about this first story. Give me these other two stories. I just I just think it's funny that after you read the story and if you go back to look at it, you're going, Wait. so this is the joke that he wants his friend to talk and make everybody laugh over, <laughs> even though he knows the ending to this story. I, it, I agree with you. It was kind of an odd setup. For, for being such a happy story that it goes into this like really sad creepy thing and i know we'll get to that at the end but i it, it is kind of weird like hey tell your story about how your wife left you bob <laughs> <laughs> like, who does that he has some shitty friends <laughs> <laughs> the basic beginning of the story that we were eased into he came home to find his wife gone her car was gone I don't know why it's very important it's the car she brought to the marriage, but we get that point several times. Well, we find out why that's important at the end. Not why she brought it to the marriage, though. Uh, She's independent, man. (laughs) All right, fair enough. Uh, So she's gone, the garage door's open, uh, and so he goes inside. His wife, Lulu Bell, which is, I hate that name. I hate it a lot, but... Uh, (laughs) I'm sorry. What? It's... Her her name embodies someone who uses baby talk, which she does, and <laughs> I hate yeah. that so much. I I was not concerned for her anytime she was using baby talk. I was like, get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> but that name, I will say this: that name does tell you this is somebody that would have an Elvis Last Supper picture. So I mean, yeah. it, it that name is true to form. I can't. <laughs> Ian, you are triggering me because I've read too much about Elvis stuff yeah. with our Needful Things episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Oh yes. How uh, many times has she name? fucked that painter? <laughs> was that the mom? Yeah, the mom with the glasses. She wants the Elvis glasses yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, a rundown of the people in the household. So we have LT, his wife Lulu, the Siamese cat Lucy, otherwise known as Screw Lucy which I do really like that nickname. That is cool. And Mm -hmm. a Jack Russell Terrier named Frank. (laughs) That is who (laughs) who populates this house. I just thought, why Frank? Uh, (laughs) It's such a random name. Oh, (laughs) that's interesting. It's LT, Lulubel, Lucy, Frank. Why not Larry? I did not catch the alliteration, but yeah. (laughs) I mean, honestly, I mean, anything but Frank. <laughs> like, I, I, like, Roscoe, Bobo, dog. Like, I mean, it's something more creative than <laughs> Wait, Frank. is Wait, dog, dog more creative hey, listen, than Frank? Listen, how cool would it be to name your dog Dog? All right? So every time, just dog, <laughs> boom, comes right at you. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the, the name of the dog from Frasier is named. Oh, oh, it's, um, um... Frank. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. 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 (laughs) Okay, I was wondering if it was, like, something similar, but, I mean, it's just a normal person name. So that's even more bizarre. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, 100%, yeah. So LT comes home, and he finds just the most super passive-aggressive note I've ever read in my life. Uh, Sam, do you want to tell us about the note a little bit? Yes, it's hard because there was baby talk in it. (laughs) And what was her pet name for him? She she just uses all of this weird, like these weird phrases and sayings. So she's basically telling him like, hey, I'm, I'm leaving you and I'm taking the dog and leaving you the cat. Even though I gave you the dog and you gave me the cat, I feel like you would agree with this decision and that's the way that you would want this to go. I'm going to go to my mom's. I 
don't love you anymore, and it's all that fucking cat's fault. <laughs> uh, I, I hate the way you feed the cat. You pay more attention to the cat than you do to me. I don't know if he wants her to like feed, like hand feed her wet cat food, and gross. That's what she's looking for. <laughs> Although I will say that tuna smell, I totally get that. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I get that. I've, I've known people that have put the cat food in the fridge. That's a real thing. That's disgusting. Mm. I know, it, but it's real. It, it, <laughs> well, we don't do that at our house. So You guys have had some bad cat experiences. <laughs> <laughs> so important question going forward. Is Lulu an idiot? Yeah. Wait, yeah? Right. Yeah. Is that mean to say? I mean, I no. know she meets a bad ending. No, I probably. think she's for sure an idiot. She seems, well, and she admits that. She's like, I'm not super smart, but I'm okay. I think those were her exact <laughs> words. Yeah. I, I may not be the smartest, but I'm, I'm, I'm good. Is that basically what <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the note I'm going to leave so the, someday. Oh, the... <laughs> <laughs> not for Devin. I don't, I don't know who for, but that's how I retire from the podcast. Yeah, as long as you say I'm, I'm not, I am no longer going to be with a spam packer's wife. Never, never am I going to be a spam packer's wife. It's so passive aggressive. Like the dude has a job. Like, yeah. At least he's he's got a job and he's working. But she talks down about his entire lifestyle. She really hates things in cans and seems to hold him personally responsible. You know, that's that's a really good point. <laughs> It's symbolism. They own a Subaru. It's compact. It. She's tired of that life. So it makes sense. Spam in a can. Mm. Mm-hmm. The, the point of this note that broke my brain <laughs> a little bit was that she confesses that while she's been having such a hard time figuring out what to do, she called a psychic hotline for help. And the, the hotline psychic told her wait wait can i can i do it because i i vaguely i'm not sure if i remember right sometimes no i'm not even gonna look at your notes i'm gonna do this by memory the psychic told her that sometimes you're a spoon but you have to become a fork and make your own choice i don't know (laughs) okay you're kind of close It was close yeah very very close the psychic says a broken spoon may become a fork that's bullshit. That it, is straight up hard bullshit. And, well, uh, so the it's that's fine. That's the what I expect from a hotline psychic. However, in the note, why didn't she tell her she was going to get murdered? Sorry, go on. Because <laughs> she's a bad psychic. <laughs> so the interpretation, she talks about toiling with this highbrow concept that she's been <laughs> given, and her interpretation is that forks have tines on them and that makes them separate so they are separate but they're still humans because they come together as one handle as the human race and that's the dumbest thing i've ever read in my entire life oh no this look i as a teacher (laughs) I, i used this on one of my students today and i blew their minds okay this is genius. Whoever this psychic is who <laughs> said this line is pure. They've got Howl on the, her shelf. Like, this is, this is everything. I love a broken spoon, maybe a fork in disguise. That's, that's poetry. <laughs> all right. That's all I can say. That's poetry. What, what is any other interpretation that makes more sense than we're. <laughs> Then we're separate, but we're all humans at the handle. <gasps> oh, it's even better, Josh. I'm going to use that tomorrow, too. This is like my that. official application to write fortune cookies. I will also be opening my hotline psychic line. I think my broken spoon isn't a fork in disguise, but a knife, and I'm going to stab it into my own ears so I don't have to listen to her anymore. <laughs> that was harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you hate it? Listen, this, you know what this is? All right, for those of you listening, if you've never been to Ames, Iowa, this is where I think you're having hostility toward. Because this whole, <laughs> I love that this story said in Ames, Iowa. Yeah. Okay? Which, if you're a Hawkeye fan, you know that you don't talk about Ames, Iowa, because the, 
that's it. There's just there's only Hawkeyes for miles. <laughs> but I wonder, do you feel like like I know these people? Like I have, I have actually, <laughs> I know Lulu and LT. So like I understood, I understood Lulu. I un, I actually understood why she needed the freedom. I know what I've seen. This couple that have gone to these fights before. So I don't know. I kind of I have sympathy for her. I actually do. And and you know what it is? It's because she did end it like a jerk. If you read the story, <laughs> she's actually saying it very lovingly to him. Like it's not like you're a terrible person. You're just like no. I just need to be free, and I love you, and this is all out of love, and. You know, hey, look, I left you the cat. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but that's also glossing over all of the talking down to him that she does during the entire... There's a part in the note that she writes about the fact that he doesn't pee in the toilet right. Actually, that I I was uh, on her side. Yeah. <laughs> well, I she I was <laughs> astonished and impressed in I think that's some of King's best writing of a character because he's a man and how he captured so perfectly a toilet issue from a woman's perspective. Somebody had to have said that to him at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I just I want to point out how she writes it in the note that she's been because she says she's been dealing with this P situation her whole life uh, from her father, four brothers, an ex-husband and a few roommates that are none of your business at this late date. What does that mean? I, I, I couldn't figure that out. Uh, I, uh, so I, I bring that up because it ties back to the problem with this couple. They clearly don't see eye to eye. That's for certain. But I knew this marriage was doomed the moment LT says something to the effect of the best tool in a marriage is silence. Mm. And I was like, oh, oh, buddy, that's no, that's no good. (laughs) I actually highlighted that. That That was it's deep. Like if you actually like really look at the story, there's some deep stuff to that. You know, it's it's funny cuz how often do we misinterpret silence for it doesn't mean anything. Like you oh you're silent, so like I'm okay. Do you guys ever feel that way or or do you cuz I'm the opposite. If there's silence, I'm like what 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 what's going on? Why, why are you silent? <laughs> I have a different relationship with silence because I my training is as a social worker and a therapeutic technique is to allow for silence. If you're counseling somebody, as the therapist, you should not be doing all the talking. And the more you talk, the less they have to talk. So when you just allow that silence to kind of rest and build, it eventually helps them to open up. So when I see something like that, I think, ooh, that's a good strategy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but not for marriage, I feel like. And I feel like there's also a difference in, in any relationship. Like, you can feel... You can feel a good silence and a bad silence. Yeah. Like there are plenty of times that I like my wife and I will get on either side of the couch and we're just reading and, and enjoying each other's company mm-hmm. in a completely silent house. And then there are times where we're sitting next to each other on the couch and the silence is just thundering in my ears because <laughs> I have made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it was it about pee? It was about pee. It was very uh-huh. it was pee related. I thought so. <laughs> You're all, a smart man, Josh. You admitted it was your fault. You're smart. Listen, all women everywhere are tired of all of your piss. All of you. We're all tired of it. A message from CM Alexander. <laughs> what's that? What's that? Well, she, she had a he had a great line in here about that. Where? Let me see if I. Yeah, a dead eye dick with that thing. Most can't shoot for shit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's, that again, that is poetry. That, that was is, yeah. King. That was my nickname in college. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, move on. So it's it's at this point in the story that I've realized that LT reminds me of the people I hate most in the entire world. And that is people who have told a story so many times that our narrator can call an act break in his story by a physical motion he does. How can you even talk to me? (laughs) Because you don't tell the same story over and over and over and over. I feel like I do. (laughs) At least not to me. 
it reminded me of Lane Hardy from Joyland. Mm. How we talked about him constantly tipping his bowler, his bowler hat. When you're reading it, it just seems like, oh, this is a funny quirk. But if you think about how long the story takes to tell, the if you count the eye rolls and all the other mannerisms that the narrator calls out, it is a it's like a choreographed dance when he tells the story. I think though, for the purpose of the twist of the story, it's really effective that he tells it so often because once you get to that point, you're like, why the fuck do you keep telling this? <laughs> and like that. What is wrong? <laughs> And and also, how boring are their lunch breaks? That it's like, <laughs> oh, hey, hey, LT, tell that story about you getting divorced again. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's my theory about pets. All right, everybody, you know, <laughs> oh, everybody loves this. Pull up, pull up a chair, Todd. <laughs> Todd. <laughs> like, that's got to be a very boring factory job. All right, let's let's talk about the point in the note. Where Lulu, they, they talk about the incident that broke the camel's back here. The, the final fight about the pets. Ian, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, so they're sitting there having this argument, and, and, you know, about how he's really, he's had it with, with the damn, you know, with the dog because it's been ripping or no, she's, no, she's had, God dang it, I keep getting this <laughs> oh, the, the dog puked in a slipper. And that's the part. That's the yeah. part. The dog, yeah, the dog ticks him off, pukes in the slippers. But the cat, she's pissed off because the cat has ripped the curtains. And she's going to send the dog, you know, the cat to a shelter. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Your dog's been chewing the nightstand cloth. With, and, and my favorite part is she just goes, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you're like, <laughs> and and you just you think back how many people have given you that line sometimes <laughs> you know well they did this well yeah but you did that too well that's different <laughs> and you're like god dang it <laughs> you know, and and i love that he's basically like and then i was on the couch and then a month later we divorced <laughs> like there's like there was just it just like went straight from zero to 60 in two sentences yeah you know? I, I slept on the couch, and then we got it. And then we're getting divorced. And that's the thing that I, I just don't understand. That Like, she says, I'll take the cat to a shelter. And he says, if you do that, I'll take the dog. And then suddenly, he's the world's biggest bastard. I think that's because, as he pointed out, in all of their previous fights, any fight about any other topic, she always gets the last word. He gets flustered. He never says the right thing. But when it comes to the pets he always gets the last word. And so I think that was just the final straw for her as far as him getting the last word on that issue. She saw the cat do that. She's like, here we go. This is my opening, my window to finally get rid of this horrible creature. And he was there to defend her. He so, replaced his wife with a cat. Okay. So let me, my brain just broke for a second. So you're saying that it's not just this pet situation. It's, she's already been exasperated by all of this stuff. And then the fact that she can't get a crushing blow out of this back and forth when she really thinks she's got it this time, that just takes her one step too far. The cat is the physical embodiment of her losing and she's not used to losing. Ooh, that's brutal. No wonder she wants to get rid of the cat. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, go back to this. Cause this, I, this is blowing my mind. Too. So you <laughs> So, so you're saying she's using the cat. It, it, it's more than just, I mean, obviously in the story they've been fighting forever, but mm -hmm. you're saying she's using the cat as like the, the, the final... The cat, yes. The cat becomes that representation of everything wrong in their marriage. And she's trying to excise that. And he thwarts that attempt. And that's when that signals to her, whether consciously or not, I don't know. I assume sort of on a subconscious level, which is why she called the psychic. And then she's mulling over the that fork spoon garbage. And I think that that's, that's not why. Not garbage, poetry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a really interesting theory. That's my theory of pets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it does go to what I've said for years. I always say people fight... And, and they'll choose something, right? And, mm -hmm. and I, I will always say this. It's never what they choose to fight over. I mean, perfect example. I used to work at a college. And 
I remember these these girls. They were fighting over a bag of chips that the other roommate ate and a, a, a twenty five cent can of soda. I had to sit there for a half hour hearing them both bitch about each other to me, like. She ate my chips. She ate my chips. And, uh, and, and when I eventually found out, it wasn't that. It was the fact that one of them had a boyfriend that was staying over and the other one hated the, the, the boyfriend. And so it was a creepy situation. But they were using this, this you know, bag of chips. That's what the issue was. Because what's yeah. safer? You ate my fucking chips or I hate your boyfriend. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. exactly what... Because it got to a point, I literally pulled out a dollar and I slammed it in the middle between them and I go, all right, it's solved. Mm-hmm. Well, what's all? You're bitch about 50 cents. You're bitch about 25 cents. Here, there's a dollar. It's yours. Well, it's not really that. I'm like, well, then say what it is. I know what it is. You guys say what it is. Well, it's your boyfriend. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so is yeah. LT being so kind of dismissive about that because he has not made that connection yet? That he Does, does LT still think this is about the pets? I think he's not that dumb. I think that... I would take the fault of this marriage falling apart and I would place it equally on both of their shoulders because neither of them are communicating clearly with one another. They're both kind of using their different things. They're they're using their pets very passive aggressively, which I'm like, wow, I would have never thought to do that. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Now, here's a question. Did she train the dog to puke in his slippers? <laughs> <laughs> or... Because <laughs> she could have, if, you, if we're going off of what CM is saying. Oh, she I don't think she's trained. that diabolical. I, I could see her training the dog to pee on his stuff just because of the whole toilet incident. <laughs> like, And now you know how it feels, buddy. <laughs> I would have a begrudging oh. respect for her if, <laughs> if we found out that was the truth. So the the story ends with perfect timing, as it always does, just as the whistle blows to get back to the factory. And that's when LT shares his theory of pets. And the theory of pets is if your dog and cat are getting along better than you and your wife, you better expect to come home some night to find a Dear John note on your refrigerator door. See... Here's the, why couldn't that be the period at the end? Why couldn't that be <laughs> the story? I was like, that's like a perfect ending because you're like, I sat through this for this simple theory that actually intellectually kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, yeah, I was, I was just like, wow, that's a great little short story. And then you flip the page. <laughs> yeah, and that, in my notes, in all caps, it just says, and the story turns... Because mm. it gets wild from here. Can I admit... Maybe I shouldn't. Can I tell you guys what I thought this was really about? So I didn't expect the twist of her being po probably murdered. What did you expect? I don't know why I thought this, but I thought that the thing about the story was going to be that she takes off with the dog, he's left with the cat, but it was actually, it sounds so stupid as I'm saying it, the dog and cat were the ones like in a marriage together. They were getting along, they respected and loved each other, well now their humans have separated them. So I thought the story was going to be more like a like a homeward bound kind of thing where the dog Aww. and the cat were going to make their way back to each other, but it's king, so like maybe... You know, they, they both go missing and LT and Lulu have to talk again and they eventually find the two animals together somewhere in the middle of their respective locations and they're dead. Oh, God! <laughs> and they realize what they had done to them. Like, oh my gosh, they died trying to get back to each other because that was the, the marriage that really, that we broke up. They didn't have a choice. That's a that beautiful like, that ending. Was, that was like pure Disney moment. <laughs> Like, it was so like, oh, this is like, CM is painting a Milo and Otis story, and then they're dead. And then they're <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's still kind of Milo and Otis, isn't it? <laughs> I remember that being Actually, dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then LT and Lulu scoop them up. They take them to this cemetery they found out about oh in Ludlow. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, and then they re- they come back from the dead, uh-huh. and they hold each other's hands, and that's how it ends. <laughs> it's actually a beautiful marriage. Yeah, there. <laughs> Thanks to the pet cemetery. Damn it. Thanks that's, to the pet cemetery. I didn't expect this <laughs> twist in this episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, so the actual twist is that the narrator brought LT over and made him tell this story at a dinner party with his wife and her, his wife's friend, cousin, cousin? Friend, I, I forget what their relationship yeah, is. D- well, to, to basically hook up on a blind, you know, essentially yeah. you know, like, oh, hey, she, you know, your best friend could date him. And, and what's a good way of doing it? Oh, tell the story about how you got divorced and pets. That'll really win her over. <laughs> it does, like, though. But it does. <laughs> I know it actually does. <laughs> but, that but, also, still, but his wife gets ticked off. It's like, well, why'd you have him tell that story? I imagine that the LT, ha- he's got to have charm. He has to have some charm. He has to have presence or else no one would listen to the story in the first place. I think it only ticked the wife off, though. This is how I interpreted it, because she suspects him of foul play. She thinks that he had something to do with Lulu's disappearance and possible murder. Because at the end, they have that conversation where he's the friend is telling his wife, like, he couldn't have done it. He His alibi checks out. It's physically impossible that he did that. And we have phone records that she did make calls on her way to where she was supposed to go. Yeah, so... Uh, I think LT, she's just scared for her friend. <laughs> yeah, LT uh, is gets a ride home because he he's got a DUI that well, it'll be over soon, so he'll be able to drive it'll soon. It'll be over soon. He uh, he'll get his license back soon. But the narrator <laughs> is driving LT home, and then suddenly LT just has a full on breakdown and is sobbing because mm. it's coming up on a year that she will have been gone. I love how this is presented to us, actually. Because this is where we find out that she, you know, they found her car full of blood and she's never been seen again. I don't, I, I really despise the parts coming after this, but I just love that moment where we realize, oh, this thing that's been built up is this, this charming story, this opportunity for him to connect with people and, and make friends or whatever he's doing. It's, it's, it's tragic. Is the, uh, is the problem that you have you with the part it. after this? <laughs> That uh, as LT is sobbing and grieving, the only two lives he can imagine her leading are a singer in Nevada or a prostitute. Oh, because every woman has a little bit of whore in them. That's a line in the book, you guys. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that was a little... That was a bit much. Yeah, man. I, I get it. I went to college. Josh. I, <laughs> <laughs> I okay. Hear me out. And they fight over twenty-five cent can of soda and, and fifty cent <laughs> bag of chips. Okay, S- saying the phrase "all women have a streak of whore in them" sounds bad. I'll admit that. But... I don't like how you're giving me that. But... Like that's not. No, you don't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, that's not my it's intention. Not a concession. That's not my intention. <laughs> okay. uh, I'll give you that. My, <laughs> but but <laughs> what what is more accurate? Because in a way of making that statement accurate, the correct statement is everyone has a good streak of whore in them. I think. Wait, a, a good streak? Yeah. Like every, I think uh, we all magically share within us the capability. Of having a whore streak. You heard it I, here, listeners. Josh is calling us all whores. I say we all have the potential to be whores, and I believe in us. <laughs> Ian, will you please say something? The, the potential is in Josh to really be a really be a good, good whore. <laughs> good whore. I said I went to college. <laughs> Wait, I went I to finished, two colleges. I finished my streak. I have two Yeah, masters. you had to go back because you didn't get it done the first time. I still didn't. <laughs> you got to go back to college again. All right. The only, you know, it's funny. The only part about that I liked was the the idea that in this weird ending where you're 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 seeing this humanity within this guy who's and let's be honest, nothing is worse than a serious man cry. I mean, like yeah. I've been there. It's I can't a bummer speak for Josh, <laughs> but like, ladies, we have got to look like the worst 
creatures when we're doing that serious man cry. No, if my dad where cries, it breaks my heart. I can't deal with it. Oh, it's 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 a word. And and I've been there with the friends when we they've man cried. Like you, <laughs> man cried. you just got to be there. Like like he is with his friend with LT. He's just like, hey, just let it out, dude. <laughs> like just you know, and, and your heart breaks at that moment. But the question is that you have at that moment is. Is he crying because he really does miss her? Or is his wife right? Did Maybe he did do something and, you know, he's remembering it. And it comes at this moment when he was supposed to kind of hook up with this other girl. Does he want to get into a relationship after all? Like, it's really an interesting moment for Stephen King to kind of put in this story. Mm-hmm. That That's really... And I and I and I hope we talk about it earlier. Maybe I can jump to it now if that's okay. But like, there, there's a lot of this human, the human nature is what I found throughout this story. Even though it's a story about pets, the 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 idea of what we are as humans really came to my mind. And and I'll and I'll be honest, it's a weird it's a weird moment. But in the book, it's you know I took off my shirt, sniffed the armpits, and hung it back in the closet. <laughs> I'd only worn it for two hours just for dinner. That's human nature. Yeah, I, I, I know it sounds funny and it's supposed to be this joking thing, but we've seen people do that. I've done it myself. I'll fully admit it. We, you know, like it's it's that truth of the human nature that I that I love in this story. And I think his friend at that moment, like, there's some real truth within that car scene of love is with human beings and where they kind of go with each other. And and I don't know, it's just a really strong moment I had when I was reading the story that everything else was kind of like, this is all like a weird story. And Stephen King uses great words throughout this whole thing. But then this moment is so like peaceful mm-hmm. that you just kind of go like, Oh man, Oh, that sucks for this. <laughs> guy. Yeah. Cause this, that scene that's after he's, he's dropped LT off and he's getting in bed with his wife. And I, I'm right there with you. There is so much for a story that is 30 pages long. There is mm-hmm. so much depth to these characters that we get. There is. And I kind of interpreted his breakdown. So I never suspected him of having anything to do with her disappearance. I felt like maybe his grief in that moment was so strong. And the way he's chosen to deal with that grief by making it like this on the surface, this kind of fake story like, oh, this, you know, haha, this is funny. But really, it's cu- it's masking this tragedy because he doesn't have closure. You know, if she had arrived at her mom's and she had called him like she said she eventually would, he could have talked to her and maybe he would have accepted her decision and not, you know, tried to talk her into getting back together or mend that broken relationship. Mm -hmm. But he was robbed of that opportunity because she was, I'm saying murdered. I think she was murdered. I don't think she's a whore. (laughs) (laughs) You don't think she's blowing cowboys? I I mean, if that's what she wants to do, great, but no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. I think that that lack of closure is the perfect way to, to describe that. He tells this story, and he still has a fondness for her as he retells this story. And I think there's a part of him that will always wonder if he could have fixed it, or if maybe he had realized things. Well, there's a lot of comfort in their relationship, too. The yeah. way he tells the story, you get the sense. And I, I couldn't figure out how long they'd been together. They'd been married like two years, I think. They'd been together for three years because they bought Frank their first yeah. anniversary, Lucy well, the second anniversary, and then the year years. after. Oh, yeah. The, so, so they yeah. could have been dating before then. But anyway, you just the way he tells the story about her, unless he's you know just embellishing and, and making up these personality quirks, you get the sense that he knows her like you would know someone you've been with forever, just knows her inside and out. You know, it's, it's interesting. I think Stephen King, you know, for being such a prolific writer, and I was like, you know, he really talks a lot about his family a lot. And, I, and you know, if you really kind of, if you, like, if you read a lot of the books or watch a lot of his interviews, he talks about, and, and you kind of, if you look at a lot of his stories, there's always that family connection. There's always like, like Lizzie's story, I mean, which is literally about him thinking about what will happen when I die. Like, what's my wife going to do when I die? Or Pet cemetery, you know, dealing with the death mm-hmm. of your child. Like, you know, he, de- he deals a lot of these relationships through, through a lot of his stories. And I agree that, that it's, it's hard to think about, you know, that I, I, it, it, the story is this guy's really, 
he's jokes around a lot, but I agree with you. I think he's really missing that. Maybe this is kind of his therapy to get, to get through this. Yeah. It's that comfort yeah. and familiarity with that other. I mean, sometimes people stay together just because, you know, we know each other, we're comfortable. And I think for him, he's the kind of guy where that's enough. It just wasn't enough for her. And it was, that mm-hmm. was clear. Cause she's like, I do love you, but yeah, I'm, I'm tired of comfort. I want something else. I want to blow cowboys. Apparently. <laughs> All right, let's let's talk about the the question mark at the end of this. So we we find out that they eventually found Lulu's car nose down in a Nevada ditch. The driver's side door was open, the rear view mirror was torn off and on the floor, the front seat sodden with blood and tracked over by animals. And then he says that he talks about the axe man, the axe man who murdered five women out in Nevada. Over the course of so many years, he was never caught. So, and if she was a victim, she was his sixth and his last. We also find out that the blood wasn't human blood that was all over the car, but that a rancher found the dismembered corpse of Frank about a half a mile away from the car. And that is kind of, that is where we are left off with this wonder. How did you guys feel about being given that final piece and just kind of sent off. Oh, you know I yeah. loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I told you last show I was on, you can kick a baby. You cannot kick a dog. <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's interesting because he takes the time to describe how Frank was very protective of Lulu. Like, even if he was just trying to sit next to his wife, sometimes Frank would growl at him. So I can't imagine a scenario in which she pulled over let her dog die, and then walked off to whore around. I well, think she was murdered. And and the, the blood, presumably, is the dog's. Because a dog was trying to protect her. Yeah, and then the dog was found a half a mile of way dismembered, which the axe man dismembered all of his victims and left them out in the desert. So the, the point, though, could be that she could have gotten away, and out of frustration, the axe man just took the corpse of the dog and dismembered it because he didn't have a lady to dismember. But nobody hears from her. If, yeah. if her dog got dismembered, people would know. She would have told her mom. She would. I mean, she would be calling. She would have been calling LT sobbing. They mur- he murdered Frank. Mm-hmm. Unless she was afraid she could be found. What if the the axe man was some sort of like horrific Stephen King supernatural kind of thing. Ooh, like a George Stark? Yeah. There's that... only one George Stark. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point, like something that she felt she could not, she could only hide from and not face. Maybe. That would be cool, but we're just not given enough for me to, for my sure. brain to kind of go down that yeah. avenue. The way that my head went, because obviously Stephen King leaves it so you can think either way. You can think, you know, LT did this. You can think there is a real Axeman. And, I, and my brain kind of went towards there really is an Axeman because I, I, I think you see him, you said earlier, I like, I don't think he, I don't, I think he really did love her. I don't think he killed her. I don't. And, and I think he even says in the story, like, I love that dog. We didn't get along, but I did love that dog. And so I don't think that he did that, but it is so interesting that that's what Stephen King wants us to debate at the end of the story. Mm-hmm. You know, like like you were saying, the question mark at the end of this is, why does he want us to think that LT would kill his wife and the dog and, and all that stuff? You know, it, it is a weird, interesting way to end this, end this story. There's no doubt about it. How do you feel about it? Do you feel like it's a satisfying ending? I, you know, uh, no, because I want... The, my problem is I want to know, I, you know, <laughs> and maybe this, uh, this might be a perfect example. I have always been frustrated not knowing why does George Stark become mm-hmm. like there's, there's no lightning bolt that hits the, the ground where the twin was buried. And all of a sudden it, you know, chemicals blown. Like I never get an explanation of why George Stark just becomes. <laughs> I sometimes I, I like making stories where that is probably more you want to leave it up to the audience. But as an audience member, I'm like, N- no, what did, I guess I, I, I guess I wanted another clue. Like I wanted him to, you know, the killer walked away, 
they found cowboy boot prints in the ground. And, you know, as, as LT got out of the car that night, I noticed his cowboy boots that he wore to the dinner. Like, I don't know, some, yeah. some little extra moment that might have got me like, whoa. Because this, really, there is, like, no connection. You know, his friend's like, nope, he, he was at work. <laughs> like, that's, that's it. Sorry. I, I, would have, uh, I would have been disappointed by the ending were it not for the fact that a while back we read The Colorado Kid. And the whole point of the Colorado Kid is that there. This whole book is about a a mystery that never has an answer, and there are too many questions to create a satisfactory answer. And so I think reading a whole reading a novel with that concept made it a lot easier to digest that being left in the wind in a short story. So I think actually reading the Colorado Kid made me appreciate the ending of this a little bit more than I would have otherwise. And you guys know my answer from the club. I just like to be teased. <laughs> I don't want all the answers. No. <laughs> I get concerned when you try to when you try to tie everything up because I think sometimes people take it too far and they make it like this bonk bonk on the head moment because they don't trust you to use your imagination and pick up on the clues that they've left you. And so I think when they kind of sit back and and give you free reign to make that decision yourself. My mind just goes like lights up with all these different ideas. And that for me extends the journey of the story beyond the physical book. Once I close it. And I love that. I, uh, yeah, I, I liked how the story did end though, where I got to really make my own choice Mm -hmm. that I, that I did like, I, I, you know, he didn't, She's blowing cowboys. Another... Oh my god! Yeah, she's blowing cowboys. She's, she's... <laughs> it, it is. Hey, I guess... also, why not both? Why can't she be a lounge singer by day and blow cowboys by night? Because no one aspires to do that. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Don't kink shame our audience, CM. Oh We're gonna have god. one listener out there who loves to blow cowboys and loves to <laughs> sing. Well, you're really focused on the blowing and never the singing. Oh my god, blowjobs are so fun all the time, especially <laughs> for women. You guys think you have it good? Holy shit, if you could be on the other end of a blowjob like we are, it'd blow your fucking mind. <laughs> the, uh, the audience will never be able to appreciate the dead eyes. <laughs> That that entire <laughs> monologue encompassed, but <laughs> oh my god! That I was apologize amazing. for getting so intense. <laughs> Blowjobs are fun. You just don't want to do them as your job, as the thing you gave up your life for. I mean, okay. Anyway, let's just move on. Yeah. To, no. to what? To <laughs> what? From okay. there? Theory on pets. <laughs> no, I, 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 CM, you're the, you're, you're, I, you're, you're my hero. Um, <laughs> no, you know, it's, it, but it's interesting. Like even, but even in that, I still, I, I, it's so weird how I get so obsessed with Stephen King's humanity. I, like, why, why does he imagine his, his ex-wife doing that, knowing she might be dead? There's, it, it's like he's still hopeful that she's out there, mm-hmm. and. There's, I just, there is something beautiful within that too. I'm, yeah. just, I'm hopeful that she's enjoying life. You know that I don't know where she's at, but I hope she's, you know, even if she's in the, I, I think what he's trying to say is even in the worst case scenario, she's enjoying what she's doing, which, which, again, is is is, is really kind of beautiful to me. On, on. What about I? I'm going to throw this out there and see see how it lands. What if those two options he has for her life are a one that he can feel if she left to do this and she's living this dream i can be happy for her and and accept it if she left and is doing this other one i can still kind of hate her a little bit for leaving me the way she did and leaving me not knowing I guess it all boils down to like, okay, later tonight, I want you both to just put a dick in your mouth and (laughs) feel the joy that that brings into your life. 
on that note, I think it's time for us to rate this story. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to uh, take a hard pass on that. Yeah. Uh, CM, but, oh, you guys uh, will never find happiness. <laughs> <laughs> CM's key to happiness. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Okay. Oh, CM, you're my hero. That's, that's all it is to it. Can, I, can I just say, though, the one thing I do love about this story? You know, Stephen King talked about this. He, he loves, like, when he goes somewhere, this is a story he loves to read out loud. And I think it's honestly that his use of language in this story you know, just, just, you know, like we, we, we mentioned a couple of them, but I, I kept highlighting the things I love. The, the living room was neutral territory or a cat likes you, you know, if she doesn't, you know that too. Like he, like he, he has all these great just statements in this whole entire book. It's that, kind of word candy phrases. It is. And yeah. I can understand why he wanted to read this out loud. You know, like, like I said, the one line, you know, yeah, I, I took off my shirt, sniffed the armpits, and hung it back in. Ah, I've done that before. You know, like, he just words things so perfectly that I can understand him going to a library, you know, in, 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 in Iowa, being like, hey, let me read the story to you. <laughs> Dead-eyed dick with this, you know, that shoots the shit, you know? Like, I just, he just has good words in this yeah. story. And I think, well, yeah. part of that, I think, will really when you hear it read out loud, lulls you into the A, oh, this is kind of a, it's kind of sad, but it's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a murder. Okay. (laughs) It it does take a weird turn. It it just does. I love it. All right, let's uh, let's go around and give uh, our ratings on LT's Theory of Pets. Uh, I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, This is my first time reading the story. Uh, Like I said, I... I really enjoyed how humanizing it was after going through what we went through with Colorado kid. I really enjoyed the question mark at the end more than I thought I would. It's, it's surprising for 30 pages, how much enjoyment you get out of it. So I'm going to give LT's theory of pets, a five out of five blue chambray shirts. Ian. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, throughout here, I, I, the verbiage he uses, the lyrics that he does, I, you know, and, and I always say this, Stephen King paints real people. Like I said earlier, I've been to Ames, Iowa. I've seen the, this couple, you know, in, you know, and I can see their house too. I can see all the knickknacks. I can see the Elvis <laughs> painting on the wall. Like I, I, I know these people. So I, I do like the story. I think it's, it's a weird structured story for me. And I, and I, and again, I, I wish there was a little bit more like I knew for sure. So for me, I would say four out of five. You know, it's a really good story. I get what he, why he did it, but it's not the best short story I've ever read of his. You know, I read this when I was in college, and I and I rereading it today. I I remembered it a lot differently. Like there there was there was more humanity within it than I remembered. So definitely four out of five. See him. This was also my first time reading it, despite some of the more colorful turns of phrase. <laughs> I did really appreciate how you can tell that Stephen King enjoyed writing this. He enjoyed writing the twist. He enjoyed creating the characters. That's That comes through really clearly in the story as you're reading it. And so I enjoy reading something that someone's clearly having a good time with. I think I've appreciated it slightly more just you know from your comments, Ian, about the humanity of it. And you can sort of picture that Midwest couple with their pets i am going to give it five out of five blue chambray shirts that is it for this episode of dairy public radio as always thank you for listening join us for our next episode where we will be returning to our regularly scheduled patreon selection series with phil Thiessen's pick cell and we will be reading through the chapter gate and academy for joshua khan and ian clink i'm cm alexander reminding you a cat can't be a hypocrite Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thanks for listening to LT's Theory of Pets. We hope you enjoyed it. As always, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Dairy Public Radio and Twitter at Dairy Public. Check out our merch on our Etsy store, search Dairy Public Radio, and visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash dairypublicradio. We have multiple tiers for you to pick from, and you'll get access to merch you can't find in our store and discount codes for our store, entry into our lottery where you could win a chance for us to cover your favorite King book, which is usually a $50 tier reward, and you'll get instant access to all of our bonus episodes.
We have around 40 episodes on there, but half of that is our early release episodes and the other half are episodes you won't hear anywhere else, our Patreon exclusive series, The Club. And if you're interested in having us cover your favorite King book but don't want to be locked into Patreon, you can always sign up for one month, send us your pick, and cancel. We can't stop you. You can also send a one-time donation of $50 to our PayPal at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. Just include your book selection. And I know $50 is a good chunk, but unless you pick a short story, that gets you a few episodes. And if there's a movie adaptation, we cover that too. And if you pick a really long book, we take just as much time with it as we normally would, so you could get even more episodes for your $50. Thank you to everyone for your support on Patreon, for sharing our podcast with your friends, for your reviews, and for listening. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.